Hello everybody, my name is Josh Loveless and I'm here with author and uh, professor Steve Hayward. Good to see you. Hi. Uh, he's recently uh, written a book called Mere Environmentalism. Um, just a, a small little concept, right? Right. Yeah, right. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about your story and how you personally got connected to uh, this oh. significant issue uh, called environmentalism and sure. why, you, why you care about it. Right. Well, uh, I mean, I suppose mere environmentalism is maybe a slightly presumptuous title. It's obviously a play on the famous C.S. Lewis title, Mere Christianity, right. which was not meant, of course, to be a systematic treatise about Christianity, but sort of a new and fresh introduction to the subject. Hmm. Uh, and in this case, this little book is trying to highlight some, I, I think, central aspects of environmental issues that people of faith should think about, uh, and even, uh, you know, secular readers, I think. Uh, because there's a lot of overlap between what you might call conventional or secular environmentalism and what people of Christian faith are now interested in, in thinking about the environment in terms of creation, in terms of God's creation, and, and our responsibility for it. So that's uh, so I'm trying to do, a, you might say, a reset on the whole matter, because uh, I have somewhat unconventional views, uh, very hard to pigeonhole. I'm sometimes a critic of environmentalism, and other times uh, you know, a supporter and you know, praise things that the environmental movement has accomplished in the last half of the 20th century. Could you highlight for us just a few of those, you know, differences that, that stick out to you? Sure. Uh, an awful lot of uh, what you might call conventional environmentalists, for lack of a better term, they view nature as just an undifferentiated whole. And human beings are really not much different than a rat uh, or even a plant. You know, you have a whole animal rights movement that really confuses the you know, distinctions you make in nature. Uh, it, it's quite clear, I think, from reading the Bible that uh, God not only sees human beings as an exalted part of nature, you might even say at the top of the pyramid, not so much the top of the food chain, yeah, but the sure. top of the pyramid of creation. We have speech and reason. Uh, we have notions of justice, uh, you know, which no animals actually have. Mm. Um, I like to say we're the only creature on this planet that uses fire. Mm. That actually, you, and that's, that's the part of why we're energy using beings, right. which no other species uses. Uh, and, and that's without even getting to the explicit teachings of the Bible that human beings are above the beasts but below the angels right. in the hierarchy of nature that descends down from God. Uh, and so that is, uh, and that comes from Revelation, right? You can't, you can't quite reason that out. I think actually anybody could notice that human beings talk to each other and animals don't in the same way, don't yeah. make up languages. Yeah. Uh, but. Uh, the, the, the teaching in the, in the Revelation, the Bible is quite clear on this. And what that means is, is that, uh, and this is a, a point of friction, is that when it comes between a choice between human well-being and the well-being of some portion of nature, uh, uh, a Christian will say and ought to say that human beings need to come first. That doesn't mean to say human beings should have a license to run roughshod over nature and do any darn thing they want. Right. That's irresponsible. That's not. Uh, uh, you know, living up to God's command to be stewards of the planet. Right. Um, uh, but it does mean that uh, there is a difference between sometimes you see some real hostility from environmentalists to human beings. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, one, there's some famous quotes on these things that I tend not to like to traffic in too much, but I do think you need to be aware of them. You know, people saying that we can only hope uh, for the right virus to come along to wipe out humanity because we're such evil beings who've ruined the planet. Mm -hmm. The planet would be better off without human beings. Um, mm -hmm. That's a real, almost hostility to human beings and humanity that really exists more on extreme. I don't want to paint all environmentalists with a broad brush on that because most are not like that. Mm. But some are and they get too much attention. And I do think that uh, it, it really does derive from uh, you know, a purely secular point of view that, uh, as I say, sees nature as an undifferentiated whole. Mm. Okay. Underneath environmentalism is all sorts of specific issues that people right. take on and uh, advocate for. Um, let's drill a little deeper into one right. specific one, uh, climate change. Um, right now there's been a rise in the last few years related to public skepticism right. when it comes to the cause and severity of climate change. Um, is that Al Gore's fault, the media's oh. fault? Or is it ignorant America's fault for dismissing it, um, as some do? Well, the problem of climate change is, um, I want to say baffling, but that's the wrong word. Uh, it, it is, I think what you need to understand about that issue, whatever you think, is that the scientific investigation into the issue 
is maybe the largest scientific investigation the, the scientific community has ever undertaken mm. in human history. Mm. Let's give you one example. Uh, we spent about $500 million in the 1980s studying acid rain. It took 10 years, wow. just in America. Wow. Um, that was then the biggest scientific government study ever done. Wow. We now spend uh, several billion dollars a year globally on climate science trying to figure it out. And it involves thousands of scientists. And remember, it involves so many different disciplines. We're trying to figure out how the atmosphere works, how the ocean responds, mm -hmm. land use changes. Um, so there's chemistry, physics, you know, all kinds of aspects to it. And you try and bring this all together. And that's why the reports that come out every few years are 5,000 pages long and really hard to read. Right. Uh, I think that uh, a lot of people in the environmental community, and, and I, I do fault former Vice President Gore to some extent. I've, I've seen him give a slideshow in person right. um, and gotten to talk with him about it some, which I enjoyed. He's actually terrific in person to talk to about these matters. Um, I think they are, uh, they've made a mistake that many environmentalists made throughout the 70s and 80s, which is uh, running immediately to the worst case scenario, uh, which in the past turned out to be wrong. They turned out to be overstated. Mm. My personal opinion is that the problem of climate change or global warming is probably overestimated, but I'm not certain I'm right about that. Mm. So I spend a lot of time thinking about what if I'm wrong, and that's why I do a lot of work on energy issues. Mm. But here's the problem. It's just an overwhelmingly difficult thing, and we're trying to predict the world 100 years out, and there's all kinds of anomalies and difficulties mm. in the scientific case for it, while the underlying case is uh, reasonably good. You know, we have warmed. The record on that is pretty clear, and I think with a couple of caveats, it's pretty incontestable. But the real issue is how much more are we likely to warm under the way we're living now with carbon-based fossil fuels and so forth. Mm. And, you know, a little bit of warming is not going to be a very big deal. A lot of warming would be a very big deal. And so that's the whole argument. Is it going to be a little or is it going to be a lot? Right. And how do we deal with those two scenarios? Uh, one of your chapters talks about different shades of green. Uh, some people uh, are driving... Hummers and right. uh, and then going home and recycling the right. paper and feeling really good about themselves. Right. There's other people that will completely refuse to use any sort of motor vehicles at all. How do you help people wrestle through what shade of green is right for them? Well, I, I don't really try to prescribe to people what they should do. Okay. Um, what I try to do, and I think people who think about this should try to do, is educate themselves on a couple of things. One is is uh, uh, you know what your biggest bang for your buck, you might say. I am a fanatic about recycling aluminum cans. It's the, it, you can make new aluminum products from recycled aluminum for about one quarter the amount of energy of making aluminum from raw materials. Right. So it's a slam dunk winner. Yeah. Some forms of recycling are, are you know, uh, less favorable in their trade-offs. Recycling newsprint, for example, you have to de-ink the paper, uses toxic chemicals to do that, those toxic chemicals and have to be put in a hazardous waste landfill. So while you may get some recycled paper, you're generating another environmental problem. Mm. So it's not all black and white all the time, mm. but, uh, but it takes time. I mean, as I say, if I see an aluminum can going in a regular trash can, I go grab the thing practically. Yeah. I'm almost nuts about it. Right. Uh, I tend not to like to be too prescriptive uh, in suggesting what people should and shouldn't do with their own choices because it depends on their circumstances. Although, uh, you know, I'm big on saying everyone should recycle aluminum cans because it's a slam dunk. I don't say people shouldn't drive sport utility vehicles. I mean, a Hummer may be pretty outrageous in some ways because they look big, but, uh, you know, a lot of people drive sport utility vehicles for real utility reasons. They have big families. They go to soccer games. They haul around cargo. Uh, I used to have one when I was uh, planting vineyards out in California when I lived there. And I think, you know, the ultimate example of this, to my mind, was a bumper sticker I saw one day. Uh, it's the League of Conservation Voters, prominent environmental organization. And their bumper sticker says, I vote to protect the environment. You see these around now and then. And it was on the back of a Ford Explorer V8, <laughs> which, you know, they often say is, I've actually said once to the head, of the, uh, the head of the League of Conservation Voters, she was saying, we need to get people out of their big SUVs. And I said, here, start with your own members. And I gave her a picture of it. Yeah. But I said, that's the face of sort of modern middle class environmentalism is people, uh, uh, you know, have, have genuine concerns and want to, people who are conscious of this, act well. Uh, but within their own needs and constraints, it can make perfect sense for them to drive a sport utility vehicle. Right. Steve, thanks for being with us today. Sure. I appreciate fun. it. And thank you for tuning in.